Welcome back everybody to another episode of Saka Drinker and Friends here uh, streaming live from Morimoto Napa on Main Street uh, on the day after the storm. I hope you caught up with uh, Didier and Susan at the studio yesterday and part of today about the happenings in Napa and the, the big storm that didn't really happen. <laughs> but uh, on another note, uh, on the Saka and Food World, uh, we have uh, our executive chef, Sean Massey, who's uh, an expert on, on seasonal dishes, and uh, he's going to talk about a few fun and exciting things happening in our menu and in the in the food world as well. And uh, without further ado, I'll, I'll let you uh, do a few words here, Chef. Well, thanks for inviting me to uh, your show, everybody. Uh, tonight we're going to have a couple of dishes that are on the menu that um, we feature here at the restaurant that we did especially for fall time and winter time, getting that it's colder. We tend to eat a little bit richer and a little bit more seasoned, so we feature a few things. Uh, nice. How should we begin? What are some of the of the uh, ingredients you're using for? Are you guiding local or more seasonal? Or Today we have a butternut squash, which we all know is popping up everywhere. We have a lamb that we get out of Marin Sun Farms locally in Marin County. Um, we have a Japanese technique called hoshigaki which is what we use with persimmons. So we take persimmons and we peel them and we dry them, we hang them and dry them, age them for four to five weeks till they become very sweet and then we clean them. So we'll be pairing that with some pork belly, so. Nice. And uh, without going too far, I'd like for all of you to know a little bit of uh, Chef's biography uh, as recently featured in, uh, in some uh, publications, but I, I want him to tell us about a little bit about where he grew up, where he was born, and how he got into food. Yeah. Not well, to put you on the spot there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't want to take up too much time about myself. This is about sake and food, but I grew up in Oklahoma, and I worked on the East Coast, and I worked in Hawaii for five or six years. I opened a couple different restaurants with chefs, South Beach, did a pop-up in London, uh, opened Maui just last year in September, and I returned back here in April. I worked here in the beginning. Um, with Eduardo and some of the crew that's still here, luckily, and so that's about it. Short. Nice. Short and sweet. Yeah. And then he also worked at other of our favorite places, like Red and Auberge. And I did short stints with Richard at Red and with Robert Curry at Auberge, both very talented chefs. It's very time well spent, good time for me. Um, good chow. That's what we like to say. Good chow. Yes, happen. sir. Yes, sir. So why don't we go ahead and try a little sake while we start talking about the food and uh, we'll start with a pretty fun uh, sake from Niigata which is on the uh, western side towards the northern of Japan. Niigata known for a very clean style on the palate as far as the water goes is uh, snow melt. Uh, this one which we have featured a while ago on the show uh, always one of my favorites. Uh, this one's called Ishishima and it's been in business since 1790, so kind of got it by now. Uh, old family, great generation, recently went with a more fresh packaging, pretty, pretty cool stuff. It's a tokobetsu on Jozo, which means it's a uh, special polish, a little higher than uh, Junmai would be. And uh, honjozo, which means a uh, brewer's alcohol added. So very clean, dry, floral. I like to say, with a little imagination, more like a uh, Pinot Grigio translator into sake. So pretty fun cleansing, and I think uh, I always like to start with this one when I have fun friends coming, because it gets the palate going. Cheers, chef. Kampai. Kampai. Hmm. That always does a trick. Uh, one of the driest sakas that is out there. Plus eight on the scale of the SMB. Floral. Very floral, definitely. Kind of high acid, fun. Cheers and. This is a sake chef would probably not drink. Exactly. Chef likes a little more of a plump style, more uh, hairy chested. Not as floral, right? Not as floral either. So, uh, without further ado, and once that we've gotten the sake going, let's talk a bit about food. So, one of the first dishes you wanted to show was the magical risotto. So, I, I, I'm in love with this dish. We, we did some changes in the menu. And this one, definitely a seasonal. Chef has spent some time in Peru, hence the Peruvian scallops, if you will. Uh, but a little bit of the play, and I'll let you talk about it briefly. So what's special about this dish is we polish all of our rice in-house. So this is house-polished sushi rice, and we take sushi rice that we polish in-house, and we make a traditional risotto with it. 
So it's a butternut squash risotto, hence the color, with crispy prosciutto, fried sage, and the seared Peruvian scallops. So this is a dish that we can change on the season. We can go from butternut squash now going into winter. We can go into sunchokes coming into spring. We can go into English peas. It's something that's very versatile, like all risottos. But what makes it special is we polish the rice in-house, uh, one of Chef Morimoto's secrets to great sushi. Absolutely. What's the preparation into it for somebody that wants to play with it at home? You make the risotto just like a classic risotto, um, deglazing with sake. And then on the finish, you add the butternut puree and season. Uh, the scallops you just sear and place on top of the risotto. The prosciutto is fried and the sage is fried. So pretty, pretty simple. Absolutely. So somebody that wanted to do it for Christmas, all they probably need at home, it's a high-grade polished sake, since most likely they won't have a house polisher. Um, the house-made prosciutto, I mean, you can get any prosciutto, right? You can, yeah, you could buy a homone iberico or a prosciutto and scallops. You can get, I mean, you could get most of these ingredients probably at Whole Foods or at the Oxbow Market, the nice. fine grocery store what there. What if you were in Minnesota or Oklahoma for that matter? Well, in Oklahoma, we're blessed to have squash, so this would fit. The scallops would be a little tricky to get, um, but you'd be able to get the same ingredients in Oklahoma as far as the squash goes. Uh, okay. Minnesota, I do not know at all. I've never... I had the pleasure of going to Minnesota, so I wouldn't nice. know if they have pumpkins or not. But um, the great thing about this dish, it's pretty simple. Uh, any home Absolutely. cook, any home cook can make it, but it's the simplicity that makes it great, right? Yeah. No, and I'm pretty excited because there's people that are watching us that are in Peru or Holland or as far as Japan, live uh, live watching the show, and this is something they could do in any part of the world, right? Anybody that has oh, some yeah. basic risotto information there and and fun tricks. I love the pumpkin, especially the pumpkin seeds. Definitely a pretty Fun and exciting. So, yeah. I'll, I'll dare you to try it with this sake and see if it does the trick. Yeah, so. sure. After you, Edo. So you see you have the risotto, the scallop, the diced butternut, the toasted pumpkin seed, the fried sage is the green, and the crispy prosciutto is um, the fried pieces of red. So squash or pumpkin three ways initially with the sage, the prosciutto, and the seared scallop. And not to mention the aromas from here. I mean, I, I'm so lucky. I, I'm getting all this big ensemble of butternut squash, the sweetness of the scallop, a little bit of that saltiness from the prosciutto. And if you don't mind, I'm going to dig it right in. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. I mean, would you say the dryness of the sake helps kind of cut through the richness of the dish? Absolutely. And very important, the sake is so dry and sharp that when you have a little more richness, it helps the sake. Mm. It's kind of like doing a little Botox on the sake, right? It's like a little lift. Botox on the sake, yes, sir. Indeed. Mm. But I would love to, before we move on to a different one, I'd love to move on to a different sake. With, with the same dish? With the same dish. In this case, we'll try the uh, Fuku Chitose, which is a sake from Fukui. It's a Yamaha, old method of making sake. Usually gives it the, this richness. And one of the interesting notes that I think is gonna pair amazing, it's got a kabocha squash finish on it, a little dark cocoa, cherry cordial, uh, full of textures and a masculine uh, appeal to it. So. You can feel the spice from the diced butternut after you try the sake, you can really feel the spiciness. The <laughs> butternut, the dice is fried and then toss in uh, togarashi, so it becomes very spicy. But normally I feel like with that sake, it really brings up the spice that's on the butternut. It's kind of nice. Nice. Well, let's taste this one real quick. And a very different, as I said, different, almost smoky, kabocha squash, richness. Think about like a holiday spice. Wow. I like that one better than the other one. It's all a matter of taste, right? <laughs> and let's uh, give you a proper weapon here so we can <laughs> try again. <laughs> hmm. Unbelievable, like a range of, of textures. That's what I got. And as you said, that little spice on it. I think you have a winner here, Edo. Mm-hmm. 
Absolutely. Talk about a seasonal pairing. You're sitting down at home, you order, you get a little fukuchi doze, and you're the star of the evening. Bam. That's just a party right there. We'll save the dishes and then we'll have the audience that's joining us today try it again. If now we have to make a little more. Excellent. So, keeping to the same sake, I'd like to stretch it a bit. And there's plenty of it, so <laughs> feel free to enjoy. So, uh, we'll continue to the fukuchitose. And then, Chef, uh, tell us a bit of what, what you're thinking on the next dish. Our next dish we have is a crispy pork belly with hoshigaki, which is the aged persimmon that I spoke to you about earlier, hoshigaki puree, charred daikon, kumquats, which are also in season. We have here wood sorrel, which one of our chefs picks locally, and wherever he can find. Wood sorrel really big in our, in our repertoire of a little bit of pork jus, which nice. you always have to put on, right? And then we put the wood cereal around for our garnish. Now for somebody at home that's never experimented with pork belly, how would you cook it? Well this pork belly unfortunately is probably not the best one for a home cook. Uh, it takes us a couple hours. We cure it for a day and then we wash off the cure and then we confit it for six to eight hours. And then we press it overnight and then we cut it into these nice squares and we sear it on each side. So a little bit more advanced for the home cook, but preparation. if you do it and you can complete it, it'll knock your guest socks off. Absolutely. And I would say, if you're going as far as house drying your persimmons, you could probably do this, right? Right. <laughs> if you're going to hang some persimmons in age I think the pork belly is right up your alley. It's going to be a breeze. So let's go ahead and try it. Can't wait. I'm a big fan of uh, pork belly. And uh, I think uh, we probably should have brought ourselves some knives, but but let's say you don't have a knife at home, so well, at least it's soft enough we can we can make it happen. You gotta get the hoshigaki, and you gotta get a little bit of that charred daikon in there, kind of get that bite going. So note the uh, the range that you have to take in, into effect to make the full effect. You can't just try the pork belly because then it'll be Sort of a one side, just mm -hmm. a base kind of note. And in this case, you have a, the whole range. You don't mind. Hmm. Have you done anything to the kumquats? Kumquats are just sliced raw. Wow. You get the, the earthiness and the strength from the pork belly because mm. it's cured, so it still holds a good amount of moisture. You'll get the sweetness from the hoshigaki puree, and then you'll get that nice bite from the daikon, and then wow. the kumquat will be the acid in that. Mm -hmm. And then a little bit of pork jus just to add that additional flavor to kind of complement the pork. It's amazing, it's almost it's almost candied in the way that it, it's coming right now with the fresh kumquats. And yeah. It just balances out all the richness, the saltiness, the porkiness of the pork belly, if you will. Oh yeah. Kind of just makes it dance light on its feet. Right. So, uh, pretty exciting dish, I mean, the wood sorrow, it's another uh, fun element that if you guys find some around your, your neighborhood, it would be fun to try. I don't know, if you're in Iceland right now, it'd be a hard thing to find, but... Well, I don't know. It's, like I say, I've, I don't, I've never had the pleasure of going to Iceland, <laughs> but... Um, One day. You never know. You know, Denmark, I think, has wood sorrow, um, but I haven't read any Icelandic cookbooks, so I, I wouldn't know off the top of my head, but... You never know what grows that's green outside your house sometimes. Yeah. Easy Speaking surprise. of cookbooks, we're all curious here, all the audience from all around the world. What cookbooks are you currently into? What are you doing in your free time as far as reading? Uh, I would say the cookbook of the year for me, which is, is only my personal opinion, is um, D.O.M., a restaurant in Sao Paulo, Brazil, uh, mm -hmm. Chef Alex. Uh -huh. um, that's one that I've really gotten into. Um, here in Napa Valley, obviously, you know, the Meadowwood, Chef Chris. Chris Costa has definitely has killed it. With that. Great, great, uh, great book, great restaurant, so you have to give big, big respects to them. And they're just right up the road, so he definitely keeps it competitive with writing a book like that. Um, those are two that are on my coffee table as of right now that are really nice. got my eye. What, what other kinds of things you do in your free time? Because everybody wants to know, I mean, chefs, even though they spend 20 hours a day in the kitchen and writing menus and tasting this and that, what else 
do, does a chef do? Well, you know, in an environment like this where it's raining a lot or maybe it's a little bit colder, you maybe find yourself getting a massage or stick it to a gym, try to work off some of the food you've been eating all week. Or, <laughs> um, you know, but when we were living out in Maui, as you know, we spent a lot of time on the beach, um, yes, swimming and beach activities. Um, so you just have to keep, keep busy, keep your mind leveled. You know, there's a lot of centering of one's mind that you spend on your day off after a long week. Mm -hmm. So, um, some of us have loved ones or pets that I'm sure take up a lot of the time. You know, cleaning the house is always a, a fun on sure. the to-do list. Absolutely. And if there's one thing that you can share with uh, with the audience about working with Chef Morimoto, one thing that you that just stuck to you. <laughs> e e too much is never enough. As, too much is never enough. As the Indeed. South Beach Bar would say. <laughs> right? Indeed. The, Absolutely. Well, thanks, and sorry for putting you on the spot. <laughs> That's such a well. I fun expect evening. it from you, Eduardo. <laughs> <laughs> and there is one more dish that we're gonna play with. This is pretty exciting. This is a whole range of techniques and preparations. Without telling you the end of the movie, but first, I think we should finish this sake. Well, I'm already and then, ahead of you. Wow, chef. <laughs> And I'd love to move on to this really fun baby. Totally one of my favorites these days. With sake, do you, know, you don't have the tannins, the rich structure that Cabernet or Merlot Syrah would have. So when you're encountered with a, a bigger dish, like spiced or fatty or very sweetness and smoky flavors, you need something to counteract it. And for me, this is one of my favorite babies. This is called Gunma Izumi. It's from the region of Gunma, southern Japan. It's a Honjoso, so we go back to the Honjoso style of Ishishima. But in this case, a whole different monster. So Ishishima, as we know by now, it's dry, sharp, floral. Well, Gunma, this body, definitely worked out, went to the gym, then decided to do some Zumo and heavy eating, and then went to the gym again. So it's, it's a pretty broad shoulder kind of dude. Doesn't always take a shower. <laughs> so it's, a, it's got a little uh, oomph to it. Umame, as we like to say in the, uh, in the Japanese restaurant world. And this baby, Chef, I'll let you uh, enjoy it. Cheers. Whew. Deliciousness. Now, it's, now you're talking. Absolutely. This is definitely, as I said, big. It's almost like a, a Chardonnay, uh, California Chardonnay with a little plump with the dried twigs. And walk in a, a forest after a rain, right? Yeah, that's, that's, they're like today. that's something Chef would be drinking. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. It's more up his alley. Yeah, I don't know if you can pick any mushrooms, but I, I can do like, I can see like three different kinds of mushrooms in this, like the aroma, the umami, like her richness. And I, I wanted to, uh, I wanted you to share a story actually about mushrooms. Um, we were here a couple days ago and uh, this guy shows up with matsutakes, the most beautiful, biggest matsutake mushrooms we've seen, at least for me. And he shows up, and uh, the staff, uh, chef included, and, and the other few other guys that work with us that the chef has brought with them, went to town. And there's, there's for instance, one dish they did uh, where they, Miller, this guy who worked with us, who's a, a rock star, he grabbed the, the matsutake, put some uh, squid ink, paint around it, sliced it. So once you look at the, the mushroom, you see a, a black layer all around it, and then you get into the whites, and the flavor is enhanced. And the thing, he took it to the next level. He made a matsutake ice cream. So uh, pretty exciting. And I don't know if you want to elaborate a little more, but you guys were all going crazy about this. Well, I think it's something that we're blessed with here in Napa Valley to have someone who can come miles away with pounds, literally pounds of matsutake mushrooms fresh that he picked um, from his backyard uh -huh. and drop them off on you for a good price and have a team around you that's excited about making ice cream with mushrooms yeah. and doing all kinds of weird things and expanding their mind and not just acting like robots every day when they come to work. So it's very exciting for us and that's one of the reasons why I came back to uh, Napa Valley when Chef asked me from Hawaii was you get to come back and you get to compete, you know, and that's Absolutely. part of it. People come in with matsutakis, that's an opportunity for us to jump on them and get them in the kitchen and get them going and give them to the public and let them know that, hey, we picked these out of the backyard and washed them and put our yeah. time and our love into them. And here you go. 
yeah. want to talk the ice cream. Yeah, absolutely. I love sharing with our guests uh, that the excitement that the, the kitchen brings. Uh, for me, from a beverage point of view, always challenging, fun different ingredients. And something as simple as an example of a matsutake mushroom going 100 different ways in no time. And these guys are just, their wheels are spin spinning and coming with new dishes. Pretty exciting. So, wait. You know, let's do, let's, let's so do let's put a little, little more sake and move on. I like that one. This is right up your alley, chef. The next dish, without further ado. Our third, our third dish, this is a dish we feature on the menu as of current. It's our play on a cassoulet. You know, a cassoulet is a very hearty dish um, for the winter time. Bunch of different meats, um, breadcrumbs, kind of stewed, roasted in a bowl, very, very Comfort thick. food. Yes. So here we did a parsnip puree on the bottom. On top is the bean cassoulet with soybeans, um, edamame is the white beans, and uh, remind me the name of the black one again. This is that kudo, kudomami. Kudomami, which is like a sweet black bean. So we make a ragu with that. And then we have lamb three ways. We have the loin, we have the neck meat that's been braised and pulled off and pressed, and then we have the belly that's been pressed, smoked, and braised and seared and then local root veg and local kale so as you can see you have all the usual suspects of a cassoulet with the beans the breadcrumb which actually is fried garlic your two or three different kinds of meat and your root vegetables so a very nice winter dish the lamb is from Marin Sun Farms in Marin County so it's a local lamb we bring in the baby lamb we bring it in whole and we have to butcher it and process each part um, from scratch basically so it's a good challenging for the young cooks to get their hands on and learn how to butcher a whole baby lamb as young cooks coming up that's a good piece of meat or a whole animal is always a fun task absolutely which is it's a crazy thing and not every place gets to do because of the size right or the budget or whatever other reason it is most times a regular restaurant will get the cut of lamb that you need in this case it's impressive for us to see that the whole animal come to the whole preparation and what would What's the difference between the pork belly and the lamb belly in terms of preparation? The pork belly is cured and then confited in fat and then pressed and seared. This belly is cured and then smoked uh -huh. and then braised in liquid and then pressed. So the, the belly is pressed in it or cooked in its own oil. This one's cooked in a braising liquid and this one is smoked and the belly's not. The only thing they have in common is they're cured and pressed. Absolutely. That's, that's the only thing they have Would in common. Would you say the reason for that preparation is to take a little bit of the gaminess away for the smoky, for the smoke? Or? Yes, I would say so because it's somewhat gamey mm -hmm. to an extent. Um, but just to touch on something about bringing in whole animals, you know, Japanese culture, sometimes we bring in whole animals or whole fish and we butcher and we try not to waste anything. We bring in a whole fish. We save the cheekbone, we save the bones and make fume, we save the heads and make soup, we use the fillets, we use the belly, we, we save the guts, we do everything. So we, we applied something we would normally use, Japanese technique and philosophy on a fish, but with a whole local animal being a baby lamb. Wow, pretty exciting. And then about the neck, preparation wise, real quick, if you don't mind. The neck we braise, uh, stock, miracle, sake, and then once it's fully braised, we cool and then pull all the meat off the neck and then we compress it or we roll it. And this one's a, a roll. So we roll it into a cylinder and cool it. And then we can cut the cylinders and then we glaze it in lamb shoe. So it has wow. a nice, nice glaze okay. of the neck meat and then you have your fried garlic. So you're saying perhaps this wouldn't be a preparation you can do at home? Well, you know, if you're going to bring in a whole baby lamb, I mean, I wouldn't see that. This is a dish that I would say not, there's not too many dishes at all that we can present that you can do at home with the exactly. exception of the risotto. As we did with the Cork Wars, which is a pretty fun show that uh, Toot Sweet I brought to all of you. Uh, last year, if I'm not mistaken, uh, there was a challenge of bringing a couple dishes and a couple pairings to do. And for me, I was sweating it. I could not find dishes that people could do at home and relate, but it ended up being a pretty fun, uh, uh, fun uh, experiment to do and uh, as far as the dish I, I really can't wait this smells amazing mm. wow lamb stew and 
the whole richness of it. All you need is a fireplace. A little rain outside. <laughs> we got the rain. Mm -hmm. And life is good. And maybe some pretty fun sake. Speaking about sake, as you can see, the place we're at, this is the uh, sake bar, Momosan bar, as uh, it was dubbed by Chef Morimoto. Uh, we will be uh, serving at the beginning of the year, somewhere around there, uh, a few different sakes. We're going to feature about 15 sakes. We're going to do Japanese whiskey, some of the beers. And more important than anything, I don't know if you could show the map, we're going to focus on the education. We want to be, be able that if you walk in here, you come in, you taste some sake, and you learn. And you leave with uh, something in mind that's going to tell you, wow, so a sake from here, it's different than a sake from there because of this and that and all the preparations in between. Besides that, we'll do a few, a few fun dishes to play with. And um, I mean, it's, it's gonna be all part of the excitement right outside or here. We're doing a lot of uh, private events as well. So we're, we're gonna have groups come here. We'll talk all about sake. And if you wanna pour some bubbles or whatnot, we'll just make it a party. That is the whole point of it. A couple other things I wanted to mention. A really good friend of mine, um, Ry Bevel, from um, the Sake Today magazine. Uh, they just started about a year ago or so. They do about 10,000 copies of a publication. Go on uh, sakeToday.com. Uh, he also does a Japanese beer uh, magazine. It's called Japan Beer Times, in Japanese and in English. Pretty fun, I mean, because everything goes hand in hand. Who doesn't like to have a little beer with uh, sake? And they do for that one about 32,000 copies. You can get it online. Pretty fun stuff. And uh, if you want to expand your wealth of knowledge in the sake world, which is coming upon us just like rolling downhill really fast, so you better uh, get on with it and uh, enjoy it. And uh, on that note, I'd like to say cheers to everybody. We enjoyed having you on the show. Thanks thank for everybody for sinking in and everybody that showed up today. And uh, thanks for Kampai having me. Chef, thank you for coming. Thank Such you. a treat and what an honor. Cheers. <laughs>